Hi, everybody, and welcome to EdTech Something, the new show that we're going to develop tonight and run a trial run of. It, uh, it's going to be a fantastic and fascinating new show organizational process. We've gotten to the point where we realized at the end of last year that our show format was designed for a time that was gone by. So the idea of taking 20 ideas a week and 20 new pieces of software or technologies and going through them all really fast became less and less compelling as less and less new and interesting and sort of groundbreaking stuff was coming out. So we've decided to take a run at an entirely new format, which is yet to be entirely defined. It will be in so 14 <laughs> minutes, though. 14 more minutes. So what <laughs> we're going to do is we're going to run... Where we're going to run 15 minutes or 14 now minutes of sort of working out the details of the show format. We're going to dive right in. We're going to do the first one. We're going to do a short version of it, maybe let's call it half an hour, depending on how we just long we decide the show format is. Um, so that's where we're at. And I'm Dave Cormier in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. I'm Jennifer Madrill in Chicago, Illinois. This is John Schinker in Stowe, Ohio. And this is Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea. Uh, and I would begin us off with a couple of questions. Uh, why have we done this so many times and what do we want to do? I mean, <laughs> what, what motivates us? Why have we us? done so many shows or why have we changed our format so many times? <laughs> <laughs> why, why are we motivated to show up 197 plus times uh, and gather together to, to blah, blah, blah? And what do we, we're not doing the fast paced news thing anymore because it doesn't seem quite as relevant because um, there's this a thing called Twitter now that does thing, that yeah there's other tools that seem to serve that need uh, so what do we think would be interesting and do we care do we care at all about what people want to hear or is it really let's get together and have the conversation we want to have and if that happens it our natural audience will find us I, I take plan B. If that was plan B, that, that's what I sign up for. Because otherwise, if we're not into it and we're doing something we think other people would like, but it's not something we like, it won't last. Then the question we, is, what conversation do we want to have? We've been doing this for, I don't know, four, five, six years now. To me, I, I, we can't do it any other way. I mean, you're not going to keep going on something like this just for fun if it's not fun anymore. So, you know, um, I enjoy talking to you guys every Sunday or every second Sunday night. And having a few laughs and sort of learning some stuff, and, and I, I really like that process. Um, but I'd like to do it a little differently now. And I mean, people, people will listen. There's going to be somebody out there who's going to be interested in whatever we do. The plan we've talked about might be something people find really compelling. I care if people find it compelling in the sense that we'll do it whatever way we want, and I'll look at it after and go, oh, people found it compelling. How nice. But it's not the driving factor for me. And uh, I think for me, the the reason to come back in the fall, which I know we had our identity or not identity, our um, well, yeah, we did have an identity crisis and we had a format <laughs> crisis and all kinds of different crises. Cri um, but it's it's the you we're bombarded with all this information and you read tweets and you read blogs and you listen to podcasts and this is my opportunity on a personal level to synthesize it and kick it around with people that I respect. So that's why I like doing it. I think in my case, it forces me to do that, where you see all of this stuff, the, the Twitter streams always going by, and Plus always has you know far too many things in it, that more stuff than I can read, and I've given up on RSS feeds and trying to keep up with all the blogs now. And I, I think if I weren't involved here, I would be very tempted, I would fall into that, that trap of just focusing on my job and getting my stuff done in my school and not worrying about the rest of the world and not really paying attention as much to what's going on in that wider audience. And, and I think this experience, at least over the last several years, has kept me honest in the perspective that I need to know what's going on because I need to have something valuable to, to contribute here. And, you know, hearing stuff from you guys and learning a lot from you guys has been invaluable for me and also uh, you know just has provided that impetus for me to to pay attention to what's going on in the wider community and to engage in that community it's motivation catalyst mm -hmm. I just like the sound of my own voice that's the part I didn't add earlier <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah. it goes without saying Dave it's pretty right, much saying that in the chat room Right, 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 well, yeah. it, it sounds like we're all kind of on the same page as far as why we do this. Well, I don't uh, know if we've heard your page. Have we heard your page? 
Um, oh, my page. Uh, I like webcasting. And I like. <laughs> I don't care what you guys are saying. I just like play. Nobody else will talk to me anymore. <laughs> I keep going back to you guys. And you know, I mean, very similar. To you got, you know, I like uh, having a conversation with this core group of people and those that uh, get, you know, brought in um, for the partially, you know, just kind of staying up to date. I don't follow. A million tweets a week and I don't read blog posts so this kind of helps keep me up to speed a little bit uh, and like John was saying it, it encourages me to do a, a bit of prep uh, so a bit and then hold the, the whole prep thing like I, I don't know you know we've talked about format uh, behind the scenes about okay this year we'll do just one topic for an hour last time it was three topics and there used to be a I don't feel the need to really uh, pin us down as far as how many topics I, I feel like the format is each week to show up and say so what's on your mind what do you think about this week and not much is an acceptable answer so <laughs> <laughs> if we all show up with not much on our mind five minutes just awesome. you know I, I that almost has never well I don't know maybe it has happened in recent uh, seasons uh, but there's enough going on that we can ramble about something if there's a topic that someone says oh you know I really we're talking about this this week and this whatever and I'd really like to drill down on this then okay and my suggestion is some for something a touch more formal than that Jeez, um, kind of so formal. I know I know and he's the um, first to become informal after he sets a formal yeah <laughs> <laughs> well it's me I'm trying to structure Set oh, up okay. the whole structure. And, go ahead, Dave. Set up the whole structure, and then we'll ignore it next week. Perfect. That's great. That that'll be not terrible. Tell us what you're thinking. You know. Can you explain that? <laughs> I can. Um, so, what I was proposing in the chat that we had before the show, when we decided we were actually going to come on, um, was that we get together and essentially take one idea and see what we can do between the four of us to give advice to either an imaginary or a real person who wants to actually use that idea, concept, technology, whatever else in their own practical application wherever they are. So it may be that you're trying to do um, yeah, I, I think of the, the Skype chats that we did, that the, not necessarily we did, but were done a few years ago between the classrooms. And just the practical problems with that, the pedagogical reasons for doing it, the challenges that are run into it, how you need to set yourself up, what are the things that you're going to run into, those kinds of things. And see if we can't sort of take our own skill sets and experiences and, and sort of attitudes and take to, to address what John had said in the chat room, take maybe a more positive slant on the on that and sort of try to see what we could put in place to make it actually work. Yeah. Yeah. So come up with a problem. Come up with an instructional challenge. I think that's an awesome idea. I think it'd make for an excellent um, conversation and something people might want to listen to. I just don't want to have to do that every week. Like, if one week we want to just talk about what's going on in Change Mook this week, or I'd love to hear about Jen's PhD thing. So, I would just not want to be too constrained, Dave, uh, Mr. Formality. Uh, I'll have a hard time remembering this in four weeks. Format. I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's another thing. Are we doing weekly or are we doing every other week? <laughs> How I are like people's Alex's idea, thought. this week in stuff. <laughs> I think it's perfect. I think yes. it's perfect. Yes. Actually, what I, I really I, I appreciated about last year <clears throat> was we did kind of have sort of an kind of an issue or idea before we, a squishy idea before we started and maybe it, we didn't get through the three that we came up with, but at least there was something there so we didn't just ramble for the first 25 minutes. And I do want to make sure, you know, I'm always lobbying for interactivity and bringing people in, and I want to do a whole separate or just possibly separate cool cast. I experimented with that this summer with MOOC cast, uh, and I've decided to broaden it to call it cool, collaborative, open, online learning. So it includes MOOCs, but it also includes teachers who want to include the, the open and the online component of MOOCs uh, and how they can do it. But what occurs to me is we've got Alec and George in the, class, uh, in the uh, chat room, 
and I'd love to have the spontaneity to say, hey, let's bring those guys in. This is a big, you know, pre-MOOC week. Let's bring them in and see what they think about this or other stuff. Don't you already have that show? Isn't that one somewhere else? Uh, I did it this summer. Uh, I tossed it on a blog spot and on my site and on at Tech Talk as well. Uh, so do I have it? I did it. I'm going to do it again. So yes, you have it. <laughs> So that, that that whole thing is to say yes, right? But like, you know, and actually, timing-wise, I don't especially like this time slot. I like the uh, like the 10 a.m. Eastern slot. It's the little golden spot of global time zones. Could you can almost get everyone on the planet in? Um, uh, so, and I'm thinking Wednesdays for that. Um, and would be delighted to have you know to hang out with you guys then as well. But Anyway, I was just saying, hey, Alec and George are here. So, yes. And, and so I wanted to yeah, address yeah. Alec's question of what's going on with the video. Uh, by default, um, Google Hangout will default to whoever's talking, uh, except you. So when I'm talking, it's not going to show me unless I click on me, and then the little green border appears around me. If I click on me again, it goes back to the default, and whoever makes noise will pop up in video. So Jeff controls who's... No, we seeing. all do. You can control who you see, too. If you click on someone, you get them. But on the live stream, yes. Jeff controls it. The streamer <laughs> controls it. Uh-huh. That would be I Jeff. Myself, oh, so I didn't know that. So I can just <laughs> click it and make myself big the whole time. For yeah, me. you can. <laughs> yep. Awesomeness. I can do that for sure. Okay, so... um. Where are we? So I think we... I, I'm still not quite sure what Jeff has agreed to. Um, well, I think he's also the one that said he doesn't want he to wants, really have He wants some flexibility. Just have to say. He wants flexibility, but I think he also said separately in a back channel elsewhere that just so long as he doesn't have to come up with a lot to talk about, and he can just nod his head a lot. Well, it's nice to have advocates. Um, That's what three of us do, though, right? Mm -hmm. Not our heads. Dave, do you feel like you want to lock into that particular we're here to help people, let's talk about this topic format, and if something else comes up, not do that? I, I don't see us necessarily not ever cracking jokes and talking about our lives, because that's not the way we've ever run the show. I don't imagine, I, I don't suddenly imagine that we're going to turn into some kind of terribly formalized highly produced show that's yeah i mean that's not gonna happen um but you know we may do that piece for a half an hour and then play around with some other stuff later but for me what i'm hoping to do is less skidding and a little bit more digging in on sort of an issue a little bit deeper getting a little bit sort of further into it and one of the things that i sort of like doing here is um taking the different points of view and seeing how they bounce off each other, particularly, again, with maybe a little less opposition. Well, the opposition will never entirely go away, but with an attempt to actually try to figure out how you would deal with these things. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep, the practical. The uh, That's hmm. what I like. At least that's what I heard from what you were saying in the back channel earlier on our um, other conversation, was the, the depth, right, into a topic and, and make it, more practical than just saying, oh, here's a cool tool you can use and try it, right? Like actually work through some of the design part of it and how it might work in a classroom or how it might work online, that type of thing, right? How, how we've seen it work before, what kinds of things always happen when you try to do that kind of thing, you know, those kinds of things where, you know, we're drawing from our different experience sets to be able to say, hey, you know what? This this could work, but if you're going to make it work, my feeling is that you know you really got to get this one piece together. So to use the example I said earlier, what we found so many times with the kids mapping up against each other across Skype is that if you don't super prep those kids and they don't have sort of almost questions written down to ask and they don't have an established conversation with those people before you go on live, you get green, 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 mm -hmm. you know, across the airlines. Those are things we know because we've tried it, right? We know that echo cancellation is going to be huge. You know, we know that all those that, that, that are just on the top of our heads because we've done them before. And then you can ask questions like, well, and where's the real advantage in it anyway? Like, what are you actually trying to get out of it? So it's those kinds of things that 
I think I would like to um, I would like to be able to to carve into and at least try it. I mean, we try it for a couple of weeks and we go, oh, you know what? That's not a whole lot of fun. That's fine too. I just thought it'd be interesting to try. You know, and I think what might be cool. I know we always try to get guests on, but if we see someone doing something cool. If we could bring them in and say, "Can you tell us what happened? What worked? What didn't work? Mm -hmm. um, that those types of things, I think, would be really, really, again, getting people to actually come on and do that is another thing. But, but I, I feel like it might be easier, you know, if if it is that kind of project or topic based, and we've seen people who have have done related work. I think it's easier to get them. I think if it's it's people talking about what they're doing. It's easier to get them and say, "Hey, we're going to talk about stuff. Want to join in?" Yeah, and I'm hoping that uh, you know one of the things that Jenna talked about is getting that the sort of the topic out as soon as we possibly can to try to get people to to sort of know that this is exactly the topic that's coming up this week. And you know, if we're going to be talking about um, one of the things that I find really compelling, I don't know how much you really, I don't know how much you guys have done, but sort of live web-based facilitation is one of those things that. I've spent, you know, the last few years trying to figure out little bits and pieces, like live facilitation of a group of people. So if you've got a class, quote unquote, of fifteen or twenty, or even like a webcast or whatever, but if you're actually thing. so any that synchronous stuff. You remember the, yeah. the 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 crazy wiki stuff that we did, and you know, if you're going to do com collaborative whiteboards and that stuff, going th and I think about the faculty at the university who are just starting to get there now and trying to talk to them about, you know what, so much of this is just knowing where you're trying to go, you know, because if you're trying to get 25 people to all give you feedback one after another because you want everybody to talk, um, you might as well just shoot yourself in the head because that's not going to happen, you know. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's well, it's not. true. It, even just in our little group, we laugh all the time, but it's really true. If suddenly next week I had to do what Jeff's doing, <laughs> I couldn't do it. And not just the well, the technical part of it, but right now, if we wanted to bring someone in, you need to troubleshoot their audio, or it's all going to be horrible. <laughs> so those are all the things that when people are say, you know, I want to have um, a, an Adobe Connect or whatever it's called these days in my classroom. It's all the, well, yeah, but have you thought about, does everybody have a microphone? Now they're going to be using their internal mic, and you're not going to be able to he hear anybody. And, you know, those types of things, I think, are mm. interesting to talk about sometimes. Yeah, and, wh and what did you think you were going to get from it? So, you know, you take the Adobe Acrobat, and, you, you know, people say, well, even if you get all the microphones sorted out, how are you going to get them to actually work together? And what's the whole reason for being there in the first place? You know, well, we need to have a live event. We need to have the right. reassurance of the human voice. <coughs> yeah, well, you could record that. Um, right. Yeah, because ninety nine percent of the time it turns out to be a lecture anyway. <laughs> so it's right. like, wow, that's we could have right. recorded that and uh, wow. listen to that. You know, what? and I mean, I've seen really good people have do forty five minute lectures and then do like stop every fifteen minutes for four seconds of Q and A, where you know you've lulled your whole group into submission, and everybody's kind of like, okay, anybody got a question? You're like, oh yeah, there were 14 people just waiting in the wings to ask you a question. <laughs> They're like doing their dishes now, you know? <laughs> right now the people in the wings are playing with the uh, chat room sensor to see what curse words they can toss in there. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> which, which I think raises the point. I mean, I, I, I think this is a great idea, and I think we should do it. Um, but I also think we should, you know, anticipate uh, the post-show or the second part of the show that's a little bit... Uh, more open-ended especially I'd love for people to show up and say oh look I need I'm trying to do this this week do you have any suggestions and where it doesn't have to be a whole topic of the show but we can just do quick hit suggestions and the chat room can share its wisdom well and that's another thing we did not have whatever was this our, are we starting our sixth year or we are starting our what year are we starting Jeff oh whatever it is. Um, we didn't have Twitter and so now um, people who actually huh? use Twitter, which huh? would not, I would not probably be in that camp uh, regularly, we could poll people. What, you know, like that was kind of Jeff's idea or Dave's idea as far as um, having every other week. You know, you'd have a week of kind of I think that was the idea instead of just being plain lazy, wasn't it? We were going to try to have a common thing we were all working on. Um, yes, I'm sorry. George was asking if we're going to do relationship advice. We can do like ed tech relationship <laughs> advice. We can do it. What if, if you have to work with someone like Dave? 
and you know. <laughs> uh, yes, I concur. You do see this is this is what the role you want. You want the. <laughs> what exactly do you mean by whatever it is that you just said? <laughs> it's like the new version of cool. Okay, listen to my link. It's just going. Uh huh. Yeah, that sounds great. Sounds really good. Nice. Very good. Okay, so do we want to take a run at this, or what do you want to try to do? Do you, you Jeff put like forty-seven questions into the uh, joint discussion thing today? Oh, there right. were six possible topics, uh, Apple, and yeah. I need to get more coffee. Okay, that's a good idea. <laughs> well, that'll get us uh, prepped up. This then. is we'll a choose very one. loose format. We'll have one chosen for you by the time you get back. Uh huh. So, do you guys actually have something confronting you right now? Something like about constructivism, or you know, anything like that? <laughs> um, yeah, that would be the interesting to talk about. Uh, let's see what he has on his list. Um, I don't think, I don't think constructivism is interesting. I don't think so. Actually, it is. I, I actually do think I've it is. I've heard constructivism is dead. Um, people sure love it. They sure talk about it a lot. Well, I, you know what? I love that topic. I really do. I think well, it's a really first interesting. First of all, probably a good place to start is what is your definition of constructivism? Because it's kind of different so, for everybody. Cool. So, did we decide topic? to talk about Jen's stuff? Yeah, I think so. Awesome. Uh, not so much my so, stuff, but we're just a general. Can, can I can I post a question in the chat room that the rest of our show is going to be entitled "Is Constructivism Dead"? Uh, sorry, is it constructivism uh, or connectivism? Constructivism. Well, there, can I put it in there? <laughs> yeah. Can I put it in there, Jen? Yeah. You you know what? It's we're 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 experimenting. Do what you want. Is our topic. Is constructivism an evil lie? <laughs> it's an evil. Well, first of all, I think, like I said, I'm not joking. I think we need to come up with a consensus on what it is. Well, not even a consensus. The a list of what people call it or, or define it, because I hear different things from different people all the time. That would be a great place to start. What is it, and how did you define it for the purposes of your research? Oh, I yeah, that was my problem. I didn't. <laughs> That's why I'm kind of yeah, stuck in the mud right now. Um, well, I think okay. Let's start. Let's start kind of two big camps. There's would be an objectivist camp, and then let's call it a constructivist camp. Just to have a real quick two different an objectivists would be you have set goals and objectives. You do a task analysis, and you have certain strategies that accomplish the. Um, the, the objectives you've set out and then and again I'm very broad here and then on the constructivist camp you're more creating a learning environment and you're gonna worry more about objectives as things develop as you put things to the floor well, that's, that's a co-constructive kind of process big, with your yep so then within that is there anything like what what else do you consider to be defining parts of the of a constructivist learning environment. So right in the throw? right away in the chat room Alakuro says, has it ever really been alive? Constructivism is sort of like Marxism, good on paper. <laughs> um, exactly. When I when I look at the distinction between those two things, I think it, it really uh, and I I'm decided that in our new format I'm Oh. We just I lost your audio you. Dave. We lost you. We lost you. Was <laughs> that a sneeze? Are you okay? <laughs> Bless you. I could have blown yeah, up yeah. the entire audience's ears here. <laughs> Can you well, hear you me now? I, yes. Yeah, Dave. we hear you now. Mm -hmm. So, um, in a new format, like I said, I think I'm going to be a little bit more controversial. I think, yeah, I know. <laughs> the, I, I think the problem with constructivism broadly is it presumes that every single teacher is going to be able to be awesome. Because it presumes that you're going to be able to sit in the midst of however many people who come from different places and different ways and different things, and you're going to somehow be able to come out with something that anyone can measure, first of all, which is just not going to happen. But also that it takes an awful lot of energy to teach anyway. 
when you have a set format, when everybody knows what the goals are and they know what the rules are and they know what they need to do to succeed, that social contract with your, te with your students is an awful lot easier. Anytime you throw that out the window and you go, oh, I don't know where we're going, let's figure it out together, you put 10 times the pressure on the person who is quote unquote in front of the room, even though now they're not really in front of the room anymore. So they're in a position of power, they have all this responsibility in order to be able to make people succeed, and yet there's no real clear format for them to be able to go ahead and do that. So like, like Alex says, no problem on paper when you look at it, wow, it'd be so great because then everybody gets to get their own stuff and they construct their own concepts and stuff. In practice, really, really, really hard. Really hard for the faci facilitator. And Super I actually uh, took a course with Tom Duffy. I don't know if you... And great in theory, enough. unless... Oh, sorry, John, go ahead. I'm sorry. I stepped on it. Go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say, it's, it's, it's really great in theory unless you don't end up you know, at the end of this experience covering the stuff that you were supposed to be covering in this course. You know, if they've learned the things that, that they're supposed to be learning in whatever class this is, then that works wonderfully. But if they've constructed their own understanding, their own knowledge, and have taken it in their own direction, you know, at, at some point, they're going to be held accountable for what they were supposed to be learning in that class, and that may not necessarily be what they actually did. So you get the whole bureaucratic overstructure, which also puts you in a, in a sort of difficult position because you have maybe a course that yours fits into, maybe there's an expectation in terms of the way that the course has been sold to the client. So there's all these other sort of administrative structures that get in your way as well. You know? how, how much mm. does a course need to be constructivist or not? And how much it, can you kind of just include constructivist ideas yeah. within <laughs> a more objective thing? And for the purposes of your research, Jen, how did you quantify this? You said you, <coughs> oh. What? I don't know. Um, you said you, you did research with five different classes. Are they, Yeah. how do they how qualify as constructivist? Well, and I was following a very defined model, the community of inquiry framework, which we've talked about a million times already, and people can Google that and get all kinds of information. <clears throat> but really, um, what I was looking at, were, again, were five classes. We surveyed the learners on uh, measures of community, so teaching presence, social presence, and cognitive presence. And um, from that, we, we also then compared it to actual grades that the students uh, received in the class. And as Dave said, um, it's not surprising we didn't see any match between their perceptions of community and their the grades that the teachers assigned <clears throat> but then when we started looking within uh, at other measures such as satisfaction and perceived learning they were actually they ma meshed up very well and um, it turns out people tend to think they do pretty well when they're actively engaged <laughs> and they're <laughs> talking to people and they know the people in their class and again I'm sorry, it's they more did well in, in a and b in those measures b was it, can perceived um, learning. What was A? Perceived learning and satisfaction, which I think satisfaction and perceived learning are probably measuring almost the exact same thing um, most of the time. Um, so, not to make this all about my dissertation, but then when we drill down on, um, in, in terms of the social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence, uh, it really came down to this whole idea that teaching presence really drives um, the out learning outcomes, which is not surprising <laughs> to anybody who, as Dave just said, anybody who spent any time in the classroom knows people who do it well um, spend a heck of a lot of time thinking about it, whether or not they call themselves a constructivist or whatever they call themselves. Uh, they do spend a heck of a lot of time thinking about what their objectives are and how they're going to teach it. And maybe, as you're saying also, Jeff, uh, they may have a lot of time spent where students are working together in a kind of a constructivist, social constructivist um, strategy, um, but at the end of the day, they've spent a heck of a lot of time thinking about how it's going to actually take place. Can I, can I just add another cross section on this for a second? Because to me, it, it's always it's always seemed to me that the distinction between one and the other is that in the way that it's often in the way that it's often done is in a constructivist mentality. You're still you still have objectives. Your objectives are things like make people think critically or, you know, uh, empower them to make their own kinds of decisions and not content objectives. So not so much, I want them to know X. To me, there's not really as big a distinction between those two things as people think there is. Exactly. Um, you know, so at the end of the day, it's almost a false distinction. You cannot walk into a classroom and not have some, in well, it's not true, you can. I've tried. 
Um, <laughs> it's, you, it, but it's difficult to have any kind of school where at some point you can say, here is the course you're taking in any way that somebody is going to be able to say, yes, I want to take that course, and not have some objective going in, because otherwise you could never tell anybody what you were going to teach. Um, so... Well, I think me, that we, we've, we've even said right. if you if you name if you name the class, you set an objective. You yeah. know, if someone walks in the door and they're taking a class on Skype, they're like, "Hmm, I bet I'm going to learn how to use Skype when I'm when I'm done with this class." Yeah, yeah. but there's certainly so difference in terms of assessment. Yeah, I mean, the objective stuff's a lot easier to quantifiably assess than constructivist stuff. Yes. Well, I guess therein is the rub. I mean, if you're teaching at a college level class, you've got to assign grades. You've got to have some some type of <laughs> measure. Uh, and, and that's another critique of constructivism is a lot of times it's a group measurement, and it's not necessarily at the individual level. So maybe the gr group engaged in great critical discourse, and there was a lot. You can measure a lot of things like, oh, there number of posts and um, you can try to do like a practical inquiry model where you see at what level did they take the discussion um, but that doesn't mean that Johnny and the you know that doesn't say anything understood a thing or or maybe he did maybe he learned more than the real chatty Kathy so you know that that is assessment is a as a problem that's an old person's word mm -hmm. and I mean he's really always been very chatty yes you know you're not going to get you're not going to get any kind of perfect assessment model anyway, right? Because you've got the, the first one where you may be able to find out whether or not somebody has retained content in their head till the point at which you've tested them. And the other one where, you know, maybe somebody has acquired some skills that they're going to be able to use later on or literacies that are going to change their lives later, harder to measure. But it's hard to measure the other one in the other person's camp, one way or the other. Hard to measure the, well, some people would call them soft skills in the objectivist camp hard to measure the hard skills in the in the constructivist camp. Um, but to take us back to what I was hoping would be the theme of this, this sort of new format, so those are some of the challenges. We've talked our way through some of the things. How do we go about doing it well? Let's assume that tomorrow um, Jeff is told, hey, we want you guys to, uh, Jeff, I want you to teach a constructivist course at the university this fall. And I want it to be pure constructivism. That's what we want. That's where the university is going. And we want you to go ahead and do that. So how, what do we do for Jeff? How do we set Jeff up to try to do a constructivist, or as he says himself, a mostly constructivist <laughs> course as best as humanly possible using all the stuff that we know and, and the, sort of the, the ideas we can come up with? So how do we Jeff's set Jeff up to succeed? Jeff's going to teach an objectivist course on constructionism. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I also think there's a distinction between doing something well and doing something in a way that's viewed as successful. Yep. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah you want to get that one figured out before we start. <laughs> I mean, and, and to some degree, you can't, you've always got to do both, right? So I do some really, really crazy stuff in my face-to-face -face classrooms, but I make sure that there's a couple of things in there that people are going to be able to tell other people about, because otherwise, they won't let me do it anymore. You know? Well, well it, uh, go ahead. Uh, no, please, doctor. Almost no, no, no. I was just going to say to your to your question, Dave. Uh, you can, do have a couple things at play. You're you're satisfying a couple different audiences. One being your boss, and the other being the people you're actually trying to help out. Um, but I think um, as far as if, it, let's let's set the boss part uh, aside a little bit. But if the idea is we really do think that there's some value in Johnny talking to Susie and having some good discourse and <laughs> and figuring things out rather than just sitting there alone. Because to me, that's the big part. The social part of it and this critical discourse is the important part. Then I think you really focus in on those activities that are going to make that happen. And you know whether it be we get them all working on blogs or whatever it may be. To me, that's the, the part that they're trying to accomplish is the critical discourse part. And that's just my opinion. To me, it's going to depend on what we teach, too. So we need a topic here. What's Jeff going to teach? Well, okay, I'll tell you what I am teaching and to what extent maybe it's constructivist already. Uh, Computer-assisted language learning is the course that I teach. And my approach, on the first day of class, I kind of mentioned a couple of metaphors. One is a mountain with all sorts of different trails going up it. 
and I say, you know, all right, here's, we're all trying to climb the mountain, uh, but everyone gets to choose their own path and their pace, and they can go up and down the mountain, but are, we're trying to hang out on the mountain. And the other one is the buffet. And that's kind of how I structure the learning materials is I have 15 different guides on different topics, uh, and I spend most of the course saying, okay, or the first few weeks of the course saying, here's the buffet, here's what this is, here's what that is. Now, cluster, drill down, focus on what you're most interested in. Is that constructivist? That depends. What, what is it do you think that, what are you looking for them to get out of the way that you structured that? How, are you, how would you mark success? Um, <clears throat> I want them to set their own, what, what do they want to get out of it? They, they do an entrance survey, so kind of not what are their learning objectives, but what do you care most about getting out of this course? Uh, and then do stuff, learn stuff. And as far as assessment, you know, how hard did they try? And I, it's, it's not about uh, learning objects or part of it. And, you know, I look at their portfolio and you can see how much different stuff they tried, uh, how far, you know, some of them focus more in on some stuff, some just kind of keep sampling the buffet, but you can kind of see what they've done. You know, you bring up a really good point. So you said when they walk out the door, you're just going to do a, a fairly subjective, <laughs> you know, a thumbs up, thumbs down, there's not anything. And I guess what really rubs me wrong with people who call themselves constructivists anyway, I'm not sure if they're truly designing it and or not designing because they don't believe in designing but they're, they're, they're following some method whatever um, but isn't that kind of unfair to the student in some respects that it, 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 they have no idea how they did really and, and what areas they could improve or, or would that be part of it as well more more detailed feedback well, I don't know. I mean, I, this is not like is a real. Wrong, the, what I'm, I'm not teaching in an environment that's really overly concerned with that kind of assessment. These are not for credit courses. These are teacher training courses, um, and I feel like my role is to kind of guide and help them get to where they want to go. Uh, if I had to do more uh, quantifiable assessment, and actually I, I do for another course, I would you know say all right. 15% of your grade is coming from this or, you know, and, and try to make it a little bit more, provide a little bit more clear criteria, I guess. And I mean, that's, in, that's funny, Jillian Code just dropped into the chat room and I had a, an extended Twitter discussion with Jillian last night, um, and a really, really good one. I think that's who it is. The name is, it must be. Um, and where we sort of talking about the, the value of the the idea of replicability in research, right? And this this maps up together against what Alec is also saying in there is one of the critiques of constructivism is that you're not repeating things over and over again and constructing something once is not as sticky, as he puts it, as having someone do it again and again and again and again. Um, which I think probably matches up against most of our experience. If you do something once, no matter if you figured it out yourself, ask Jeff with a server. Um, you may figure out how to fix it once and then forget the next day how to do it again. Whereas if somebody sat you down and made you do it 50 times, you may actually remember those things. So there's important things, but what it comes down to is what we're trying to get out of this learning process in the first place. right? So if what we're looking for is the retention of facts and the retention of patterns or retention of skills, I don't think constructivism is a particularly great way of getting there. If there's something we can point to and say, that is the thing you want to be able to learn. Language learning's not really like that, right? When you, if you know the the average sort of second language speaker uses what two, three, four, five thousand words, right? And they're very, very different words depending on who that person is and what they do and what they're interested in. They may be somebody who for whom writing is important. That there's all kinds of variables in there. Very difficult to go. This is the set of things you need to know to be able to do this. Different from you know, Joe in his factory turning the button with his right hand. Every time he turns it counterclockwise, counterclockwise, he succeeds. Right? Every time he does that, he wins. But with the learning process, and to me, with constructivism, where it comes in, or at least where it becomes a bigger part of the conversation, is where the fact of the matter 
is not as important as being able to address the matter, to be able to engage with the matter, right? And I think with your language learning, your buffet model seems to seems to be it sounds like constructivism to me, and it sort of plays that out because it doesn't matter which one they take. The, the, the retention of any specific content is not of any relevance, right? It's the fact that they actually engage with the content that's important, not the content itself. Does that, maybe I should, yeah. Well, I mean, if I were to assess, I, I would be assessing retention a little bit. Like I want to, you know, I also talk about their tool belt and I want to see their, I want to see their tool belt by the end of the course. Um, and not just have engaged with it, but, and not mastered it, but acquired some retainable skill, I hope. <clears throat> using an example, um, the, the, I did um, the the NASA folks are doing that design channel challenge again this year, and I evaluated the program for last year. And basically, very constructivist. They have a problem they work on. Um, they don't have any prerequisite. Um, they, there's no no pre prerequisite knowledge when you come into it, and there's no subject matter guides. There's no nothing like that. It, they basically provide a, a toolkit of resources have a problem and then it's up to the kids to Google their heck out, of, <laughs> the heck out of it and try to figure it out. They have access to experts when they get stuck and have questions. So what it turned out to be at the end of the day, what they were assessed on is kind of what Jeff's talking about is a portfolio where they really wanted to see how well they work together as teams. So really what they were assessing became teamwork, collaboration, uh, well-documented projects. And I kept asking over and over to the engineers who were there as subject matter experts do you have any sense that these students know any more about how to design, in this case it was, a, a, I think, a telescope, than they did when they came in? And fortunately, it was hard to say they did. Because again, you have the whole group issue. You don't know what one did versus the other. And then maybe the ones that were better at putting together a portfolio that looked prettier, you ended up giving them a better score than those that maybe didn't spend as much time putting together a nice, with a nice little bow on it, their, their portfolio. Um, so I, I was very, I felt very upset <laughs> when we, the whole thing was done that I don't think we had any idea whether or not the, this was teaching kids to be better engineers. Maybe better collaborators, better teamwork people. I don't know. That, that's kind of my critique of it from what I saw. Do you, has anybody else had that similar experience where you can't really say that they can do what they're supposed to do any better? Speaking of critiques, I'm kind of interested in hearing the critique of your work. Uh, basically, you, your your advisor wants you to be harsher on constructivism, uh, and it seems to me like the whole PhD process seems a little bit more constructivist than objective. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. It, well, it, 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 I've said it before. Dissertations, one just giant, big, independent study project. So you set your own goals and you pretty much work through and ask for help when you need it. And then all, all of a sudden, someone will come in and say, "No, no, 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 you did that totally wrong, and go do it this way." Um. But um, yeah. I, well, anytime you do a dissertation, you're supposed to have the discussion section that ties in what, how does your research tie in with what's come before you, and what do you. I think how the, does this inform those that come after you and um, I did not necessarily focus that much on constructivism even though the model I was looking at was social constructivism because I again I, I think I have a really hard time defining what it is it's it's different to everybody and I didn't really want to get in that quagmire of defending or not defending constructivism I would rather just talk about what I saw so I, I think there's another a uh, really important point here, and Matt alludes to it in his comment here. I think the difference that is that the learner gets to choose what they want to practice and repeat and when they need it. I think <clears throat> any critique of constructivism and any t any sort of pain that you have yourself in your own course is something that's going to get better, particularly if you can get those students inside of a system that does it for longer. Because one of the things that I find in MOOCs, one of the things that I find in my own class, uh, in my classes, the ones that I've done this in are terrifyingly intense, um, and students drop out. They just can't take it um, or don't want to. Is that people need to learn to become their own masters, right? As long as, because the, the instructivist model is, is born in this idea of the university, the boss, the whatever, knowing exactly what it is you need to know and then giving it to you. If we presume that the client or the student or the learner 
is somebody who can actually make those decisions. They need to get to the point where they practice the things they need to practice to make it stick when they need to, not when they're told to. And that's the difference between a society where you build drones and a society where you encourage creativity. And to me, the problem with that then becomes what happens if 90% of your society is a creative and nobody's willing to drone? Well, sounds really great, except our society is not built that way. You know, so there's a lot of challenges around this because to me, constructivism is to some degree, at least from a historical context, elitist. Right? It is the model by which we train people to think for themselves. Traditionally, we have not done that with education, except at some of the higher end, higher level institutions. Right? So to me, there's some, there's some fuzzy business in there too, where um, we have to make some sort of class distinctions, whatever else, at a, at, a, at a meta level about why we do this kind of learning stuff. At the practical level, in Jeff's case, you know, to go back to his classroom, you definitely want those kids to believe that they can learn English on their own because they're not going to do it any other way. No matter how, and Jeff is a fantastic teacher. The couple of times I've seen him, he has that, he has that sort of thing about him in a classroom. Um, but he really does. Um, but they're not going to learn English because he's their teacher. He's not going to learn English. They're not going to learn English because of what they learn in his class. They may then go out and learn English. But it's not something you can do inside of a classroom alone. It just can't happen. So I think what, in his case particularly, constructivism is, is really useful. Um, maybe you can, Jeff. He's looking at me cynically. I, I can do that teaching. Maybe they actually I, 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 uh, Just to clarify, I'm not teaching language. I'm teaching computer-assisted language learning, so how to use technology for language learning. So the goal itself isn't actually to learn the language. Um, but how much is this uh, an issue out there in education? I mean, is this something that curriculum designers and university administrators and public school principals are dealing with they're they're saying okay how, like how is this playing out on on the main on the, I, on the I think front? it's a problem in that it's the whole um, which camp are you in and you have to be in uh, there's this idea you have to be in a camp and y you know if you, you can't do it the old way instructional design is too locked up and so what happens then in practice constructivism just becomes in practice a mess because <laughs> it's just it's not well defined and there's it, there's not enough guidance as Dave said right at the outset not everybody's cut out to do this and so if you're just going to say okay I'm gonna throw the kids together I'm gonna give them a problem and I'm gonna see them when they're done unfortunately that happens a lot of times at least in my experience in college anyway it's like here's a problem and, go and work at it and turn your paper in in K-12, it doesn't happen enough because everything is so focused on standards that, you know, it, it's all about achieving knowledge or acquiring knowledge and skills. And so, I mean, as this discussion has gone on, it's, it's increasingly clear that constructivism may not be the best approach for that. And so teachers are trying to do dynamic things or wanting to do dynamic things in their classroom, but are having, are always struggling with that you know, at the end of this course, they have to take this test that is going to measure whether we like it or not. It's going to measure their acquisition of facts and skills. And so if they have those facts and skills, then they're labeled as a success, and the school's labeled as a success. And if they don't, then they're not. So while we compare that with things like, you know, 21st century skills thing, you know, where we're trying to trying to get our students to be creative thinkers and, and do critical thinking and communication collaboration, those are things that uh, are de-emphasized because they're not measured. And I mean, for you guys, you end up stuck, you know, in that, I, I think we'd all agree, uh, certainly based on this discussion, that while you may acquire those skills and facts through constructivist means, you're not going to do it as quickly. Certainly not as quickly for reproduction in the way that you need to. Would you say that's fair? Mm-hmm. I mean, constructivism seems to be like the long model, right? Give the people, it's that whole give the, well, you know, you're right back down to it. Teach a man to fish, uh, give the man the fish. It, it seems to be that distinction, except it's more like fishing in the 21st century where you know, there's a lot of places there's no fish anymore. So you may teach me to fish, but I may go out there to fish. There may not be any fish. But whereas I'm real sure if I walk up to you and hand you a bucket of fish, that you're walking out the door with a bucket of fish. And is that sort of like in a guarantee sort of balanced background? Is that the distinction we're talking about? Well, it, it, 
if the school is measured by how many fish the kids have when they leave the school, then it's much easier to give them a bucket <laughs> of fish. Mmm, fish. Fish. <laughs> uh, question of format. Or uh, I chocolate see we're chip coming or toward the end of the hour. I feel like we've drilled down a little bit on this topic. Uh, do we want to open things up, invite people in? I would. Well, you know, we've got a lot. This is probably the best chat room we've ever <laughs> we've ever had. As far as best people. one we've had all season, Jen. <laughs> best all season. But um, yeah, I'd love to hear. Like, I don't know if Matt's available, but you know, he had a perspective as far as using a constructivist approach in the in the classroom, and I'm I'm just very curious what that approach would look like and mm -hmm. what it would be. If he's and around. we are in plus, right? Do they have to have plus accounts to join us? They Jeff? do have How to have plus work? accounts, and they I can I can open up the Hangout and make it. Th this is a little functionality that's a little. Uh, not great. Uh, I can open up the Hangout so it's public, so anyone can join in. Anyone is going to see it on my Google Plus page, and who knows? Maybe we'll get people. Hey, how's it going? What's going on? <laughs> um, or we can invite people one by one if uh, I know their Gmail address. Okay, I'm just going to read what Matt said until he either gets himself set up or, or whether he decides not to or not. But um, he said uh, he considers a constructivist approach to be Montessori models. Uh, free school student direction where the learning isn't directed by the content, it's directed by the interest of the user and the learner. Um, what do you guys think of that definition? And w with the guys with kids, would that scare you or make you happy if your kids were going into that type of setting? Where the they. The Go ahead. To me, it's the practical problem, right? At some point, they're going to leave that. And the odds of them getting their first job or their first interaction, whatever else, in a place where that's what they're allowed to do is super unlikely. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm, not worried about, I'm not worried about Oscar learning how to do stuff. I'm not worried about him being able to read or write or science or he's, I mean, <laughs> he can tell you right now how oil gets taken out of the ground and that whole process all the way from it, you know, going outside of our house. Like he's he's gonna learn it. The problem is, is he needs to be able to learn how to interact in the rest of the society that is not constructivist. Those are the things he needs to learn how to do. Which is, wait when it's somebody else's turn and he's got to sit there and he's got to deal with being bored. Those are the lessons that he really needs. Now, I rather if he was doing it in a more supportive environment than the way we've got our school system set up. Not that he so you, go to, a group. <laughs> you go to school to learn how to handle being bored. Hello, and a. M. Cunningham. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> no, you see, I've disrupted everything. Not at all. Uh, any Please. thoughts on the uh, blah 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 so far? Um, well, I was last week. I was at. Um, well, first of all, I'm well, I'm in the UK, obviously. I was at Alt C last week. Mm -hmm. And we had Karen Cater um, mm -hmm. come in, you know, and I mean, she wasn't. She, I wouldn't have said she was talking very much about the future of education in the U.S. Having constructivist approaches, there was lots about metrics and figuring <laughs> out <laughs> that we just said we just didn't have the data now. We just didn't have the metrics now, but it was coming, and then we'd be able to just figure out all this stuff, and you turn up. And somehow or other, the teacher then would know and personalize, and everything would be like this. And uh, I mean, she made this kind of analogy to like medical records. You know, people now have access to the medical records and they go down. But your medical record isn't your health. And we're still very far away from being able to figure out just what is wrong with somebody from a set of data. So, anyway. Of, of all thought, the countries to go and give that presentation in. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. I mean, you guys, you guys are struggling. I mean, you're coming a little bit further back, but I mean, you look at the the British health system; it's exactly the opposite from that, right? It's nothing about men; it's all about the total person and the blah blah. blah. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, we yeah. hope, we hope, but that, I don't know. But there no, we, but that's, there we go. But that's but the goal, was, at least. Yeah, that's but she the, was. That's the rationale. I mean, this was a, an educate. I just happened to be in both zones because I am a doctor and. Yeah obviously interested in education so it was just particularly interesting for me this belief in the metric so it was 
but I don't know, you know, it just struck me that that's not particularly, that's about saying we've decided what the outcomes are going to be and we just have to figure out who has met them or who hasn't and then we can program, set up a program that will really help them get there. It works really well for funding and I think this is the, when right. you look at the whole metrics thing, like particularly in the States, particularly right now when you look at the way that the American government is giving out funding to people, if you can say that you're going to be able to measure it and you're going to be able to measure mm -hmm. success in those kinds of ways, that is a yep, pathway yep, yep. to all the money that you want to do. So I don't know mm -hmm. how much somebody like, like her actually cares about the learning process mm -hmm. more so much as understanding that the bureaucrats of education, the people who have to be able to prove that other people are learning, desperately want to have this thing. It was a couple of years ago, the, the New York City Education Department spent, was it $80 million on a student information system that mm -hmm. would gather the data that you're talking about um, because all, they figured that as long as they could track all those students, I mean, to put it bluntly, you get to blame mm -hmm. the ones who aren't doing the things that they're told to do and blame their failures on them and not yeah. on the education system and then you'd be able to you know you can report back in ways about your at, initiatives at the, of, in the way that at the level of the individual student or the level of the individual teacher oh yeah. Oh yeah. you could have both you can do both well yeah. for reporting purposes you can do it for both and I mean again mm -hmm with uh, education and John can speak much more specifically about this but mm -hmm. the scores of the individual students directly um, impacts the amount of funding that you get from the government mm -hmm. so if your school performs badly and the students in your school perform badly you get yeah. less funding from the government which yeah. is just about the craziest thing I've ever heard of but uh, is that accurate John or did I oversimplify it, that? It can um, I, it doesn't happen at least in Ohio it doesn't happen like exactly like that right um, schools typically parents get more choices if their schools are very bad uh, in in where they can send their kids and the uh, administration of the school district then falls to the state level uh, where where they have oversight and, and intervention that way I don't think that it's specifically related to funding Dave um, mm -hmm. but we also have a very um, unusual funding system or, or broken funding system really in, in how schools get funded in general most of that is local money anyway mm -hmm. so uh, that, that can vary widely from uh, school district to school district mm. but but it was, it was yes there is more? there is an emphasis you know when schools are measured and compared to one another yeah. there is an emphasis on on student test scores and students in subgroups so if you have <laughs> That's that's as an outcome measure. This was this idea of really um, right. as a process, like ongoing all the time. Um, you would just have this idea and be able to tailor and personalize all these classes. That somehow or other, this personalization idea is that something mm -hmm. you're, you know, um, uh, which you could say was, you know, like meeting each child. But but the idea is that. That you would have determined the outcomes very obviously because you're not leaving it up to to the child. No, no talk about the child deciding which metrics they wanted to follow and were were, were going to be more important to them. Well, yes, the the metrics are certainly standard for uh, for all children, although yeah. they do make adjustments to those in in some cases where yeah. students are on indiv individualized plans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there we go. But that was all. And I was also coming, the other thing is, um, are you familiar with Basil Bernstein, this English sociologist? No. Yeah, he, he talked about code and different kinds of code and it seemingly, it was kind of, and he said that, that um, middle class children had access to different kinds of language and they were able to, therefore, in these kind of constructivist sort of situations, able to make more sense they were used speaking in a different way which allowed them to get on further which is why uh, which was taken as being which was kind of misinterpreted as it came kind of being classist rather than sort of stating something that he had empirically observed um, but that that I think reflects in a way why you have these schools but because the other the thing is if it, if it thing he talks about framing class and classification and framing and if things are weakly framed and weakly classified between the knowledge you have to give an awful lot of time obviously to ensure that everybody manages to get up to speed um, mm -hmm. to, you know to that time before you just move on to the next area and most of the time that doesn't that doesn't work or it doesn't, doesn't happen in practice, so some children are going to get 
yeah, left behind. Um, and even, you know, say things like problem-based learning in medical education, which came out of like McMaster in the 70s, which was based on this people identifying their own learning outcomes and, and going off and doing this. They found then that they started providing more didactic sort of training as well, in a sense to let people catch up. That you still yes. need to kind of do yeah. this, otherwise you you will have people. Pop. But of course, you're learning that in a different way then. So, which is my point about say. yeah, it's yeah. my point about my son going into into yeah. the K twelve system and why I'm hoping that he's going to learn those other because it, they're not the the constructivist literacies that you're talking about because he has those already. Mm -hmm. He got those in this house. He walks up to a problem and he goes, oh, and he'll take it on and do it in his own way yeah, and whatever. Yeah, yeah. But what he doesn't know how to do He needs to be those, socialized. <laughs> he needs to be socialized into those school literacies that are the foundation yeah. of much of our workplace, right? Yeah. Interactions. Everybody so has a place. There's a role. There's a step. There's this stuff that's in there that underwrites you know the way that knowledge management happens inside of corporations. The way that all yeah. is all built on these these building block foundations, where you can have somebody yeah. who has a task that is absolutely unconnected to the next person in the task. Even though, if those people actually knew each other, their lives would be a lot easier. But people are able to completely work in absolutely disconnected roles because that's the way they've been taught for twelve years. And you, you want know, him to be able to fit into that. You're worried that he wouldn't fit into it. I want them to at least be able to understand it because yeah. it's like yeah. he, he also goes to church with his nanny. Now I'm just about as close to an atheist as you can possibly structure. But yeah. if you live in North America right now and you don't understand the Christian ethos, mm -hmm. there are conversations you just can't understand. You cannot be engaged in them. You can't talk to people. You mm -hmm. can't understand movies. You can't. There's all kinds of stuff you will not get. Now, whatever decisions he ends up making about his own religious life are up to him. But I want him to be able to have some kind of foundation to be able to understand the culture around him. And those two yeah. pieces, which are not my pieces, they're not things he'll ever yeah. learn from me. Let's let's face it, structure is not what he's getting from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, we don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, that stuff about the structures and the weird ways in which those yeah. come together and, and, and the religion is another good example for me. They're such foundational stepping stones. If we could yeah. ever do something in our society where those constructivist things were, were built up in the same stepping stone kind of way, I think Jen's research would come out differently, which is yeah. where all that was going. I think that it's you, because people don't have the literacies. You're saying that if we did, if we did really follow um, Ivan Illich and really de-schooled society, if, it, if everybody was de-schooled, it might be okay. Is, is that maybe true? But while yeah. it isn't, <laughs> while we're working within this imperfect system, you still have to learn the rules. Well, and so. not only that, not only imperfect, uh, if you go to a job, they're going to have a certain task they want you to accomplish. And you can't go, you know what, today I don't so much feel like doing that task. I'm going to go <laughs> over there and do it. <laughs> and I don't want to work with this it depends John on the job. guy. And, you know, I you mean, know, yeah, the guys you, can, you maybe can find a job like that, but yeah. But, but wouldn't it, it's not just about that. Would it not be more that you would... Um, ide ideally, you within the organization would have be, have such a good overview of what actually needs to be done that you'd be self motivated <laughs> and going about doing mm. it yourself, there rather you than be doing somebody's watching over you. Well, it's funny. That's almost exactly the role that I have in my organization. Um, I the motivator. Have, uh, I I get to just pick projects. They're, yeah, they're yeah. because of the stuff that I do. Um, I have. A series of things that I'm responsible for that need to get done in that other way, where you know it's not it's not an option; they have to get finished. Mm -hmm. But there's this whole other thing where I'm kind of expected to go out and pick things that I'm going to try to do something with, and I can just kind of go mm, that one. And as long as I can make a pitch for it, people don't really have a problem with me going ahead and doing it. Um, now, not a lot of people have that. Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. Yeah, um, other, yeah. The the other person uh, uh, that I'm interested with recently is, do you know um, Robert Keegan's work about constructive development model of adult transformative learning? So he talks about these three different, well, five different levels, and you get to the third level is kind of socialized mind, where you're, you're, and it's all about what you see as subject and object. So socialized mind, you're, you know, you've got the rules, and you operate at that level, um, and you're, you're 
looking to you know to do what others actually think that you should do and that's how you're judging and then self-authoring mind is where you've internalized the values you're you're doing yourself and you're able to see the rules outside of you and then you've got self-transforming mind where you're able to actually step outside and see how your own interpretation and values have came about in relation to all the other things that are that are going on it's a bit more postmodern you could say so I think that's the thing yes that not everybody and that's what he will in this in these in this kind of because this in a way he's came out even he's a professor in Harvard psychologist but they've done an awful lot of work in the business world um, and they've gone around actually testing this and come up with a, a kind of way of being able to validate where people are at and most people only get to this fourth level of self authoring most adults hopefully are, but if you're going to get to this self-transforming mind, that might be around the time we're like 30, 40 or so. And in a way, constructivist kind of approaches are to a certain extent based on definitely these higher levels. And maybe most, but, but are most people not at those higher levels because of what we've done with them through education or for some other reason? I think that, that's not what's entirely clear. No, it's very true, it, it, and I even just see yeah. that in uh, in my classes where mm -hmm. some kid students I could call them kids, but like you're saying, they're probably thirties and forties. <laughs> it's just not what we're used to, and so it's like, well, well, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to tell you in this paper? Yeah. What do you, you know, that type of thing? Even when you give them choice as far as topic to pick on the paper, what? what yeah, do you, what, yeah, what, yeah, what yeah, paper would you like? But actually, Leonard, had, I believe it's Leonard, has to run, but it brings up a very good point. Constructivism isn't. Um, dead, and he says it's a learning model as opposed to a teaching model, um, and that's again what I was kind of saying at the beginning. Yes, it's yes. it's different things to different people. Is it Leon yeah. or is it Leonard? It's Elio. I think it's Leonard. Leonard Lowe. I thought it was I thought it was Leon first, and then I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but that's a very good point. Is um, it, I think it truly was forwarded as a, a learning model, and it's slowly over time, um, as people are saying, "Okay, well, that's great." But then, how do we? Um, how do we actually help, help how do we accommodate it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do I force you to think for yourself? <laughs> 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 exactly. Well, I'm getting a call from the kitchen. Like my my dinner oh, yeah. is served. We're 12 uh, minutes past time, guys. Thank you very much for letting me join no, in. Come back, oh, great come back anytime. No worries. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. You should us. probably sleep more, though. Seriously, <laughs> this has got to be past your bedtime. Yeah, yeah, it is past my bedtime. I was up very late last night, so I have to go to bed <laughs> now. The patients will be checking. Will be kind of be stocks under my eyes tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Bye -bye. Glad, bye. Thanks bye -bye. for coming. Bye bye. Bye, bye Anne Marie. Okay. Um, before we wrap up, I'm wondering if there's anything we want to plug. Uh, I know Change MOOC is starting this week that you're involved in. Tomorrow. Dave. Yep. Change MOOC starts tomorrow. Go to change.mooc.ca. Subscribe to the newsletter and you're registered. The Daily. Uh, and I'm thinking I'm going to start the Cool Cast Wednesday, 1400 GMT. That's 10 a.m. Eastern for you North Americans. Um, and talking about, there's a few MOOCs going on, but also the larger question of how to bring the open online stuff to your teaching, even if it's not massive or a course. Um, and I'm wondering if this new format is about tackling problems people are facing, might we want to encourage people to provide that kind of feedback via like a comment or something they could go to this show <laughs> post on edtechtalk.com and I wish I wish we could do audio comments you know that's a great <laughs> idea let's look into that or like a what's a voice thread would be super awesome if we uh, could do that. That. can we get like a my chingo or something going <laughs> you people could just go to the site and leave comments you guys, and then guys. Um, all right so are we done yeah, I think yeah. we're done. We're, well, we're going to be back when? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> next week? Oh, yeah. Two weeks? Next year? Let's. My, my feeling December would be year. let's do it weekly until we don't want to. And, right. and I was, I don't know, Jen, Jen was really excited about the idea of going every second I week. Like, I like snow days. You know me. I like every week and then gives us more of an opportunity to take a week off when we don't want to do this. Okay. I think we should go for And what was this show Although, called? Is this EdTech Weekly still? It's EdTech I guess Weekly. I, yeah. I guess Should we change to like EdTech kind of weekly? Is this our 200th episode then? EdTech occasionally. Uh, 197 or 8 198, or something. I think. Yeah, 198. Oh, I thought we were there. Are you sure? I think there are a couple Sorry, that didn't Jen. get posted <laughs> we took last year. too many weeks off. 
did, so, did one or two maybe not get posted last year? I'm just saying. So do we need a topic for next week already then? That's the problem with the whole weekly thing. That's been a, like, I'd like to spend a week thinking of a topic. Um, well, come up with a topic for next week, and then you can spend a week coming up with a topic for the following week. I came up with a topic for this week. Jen stuff. Um, okay, topic right. next week, uh, Google Just Plus. Lost. Okay. All right, Google Plus. How do you use it? How do you um, use it in the class? You know, Just what about it? How do you use it? Education? Is it any different? Is it a world changer? Um, yes. And then the tweeters in the group, show. like like Dave, I guess it would be, and John sometimes. Like, I think that'd be great to ask people to think about it and come join us. Like, think about it early, like now, Monday, Tuesday. And I may try to recruit some people who are doing stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, man, okay. this new system is really efficient. So basically we have the same name, same time <laughs> slot, same number of days, and basically talk about one topic. The only difference is that instead of doing show prep five minutes before, we've done our show prep already for next week. Wow. Except this week we didn't. Awesome. The wisdom of experience. <laughs> It's so different. I can't get my head around it. I, it's going to take me a week to get my head completely around. Okay, so then we're committed. Then we're committed to never finishing a show until we have the topic for next week. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Dave's, Dave's gotten so saying. into these like forced restrictions. Like Look, it's guys, September. I have, it's September. I have, I, have, I have the brain of a goldfish. <laughs> you guys are like, oh, Which Dave is why didn't put it. Didn't That's why I just put the topic in the sky chat. Saw, I saw you do it. <laughs> so that Dave we would remember. Like, oh, next there's a show. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday night. Is it Sunday night I have shows? I've only been it's doing this for five again. years. Uh. Uh, and to answer Jillian's question, is this about social networks or about Google Plus? Um, Google Plus, in the context of comparing it to other social networks, people have to go. Let's wrap up. Have a great week, everybody. See you next time. Look what was just delivered to me. Look it. Wow. Can you see? Wow. I think that's my hint. It's like the, the seven times he called Romantic me. Romantic night on the terrace by yourself, Jennifer. <laughs> I think that's what he's saying. I've been sitting here <laughs> for 45 Construct minutes. Construct this. <laughs> Construct this. On that note, always a pleasure. Okay. Ta-ta. Ta. Have a good week. Bye. Bye. Oh, and Chusak Chabo Naseo. Happy Korean Thanksgiving from Pusan. <laughs> yeah, what he said. Bye.